So where are we in the process right now? I'll flip back to that image. Great. So, so here's where we are as a class in this process right now. We're composing and we're refining. We're eventually going to get to editing and then we'll have that final manuscript. So I'm gonna go back to Word. Here's that quote unquote final manuscript. Uh, it's composed, um, for example, we have lesson two up here has a chapter number. Uh, we have a chapter title. We have A head, C head, text. Um, it has been refined. One example, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, one example is that there are changes made to the styles to allow for spacing distinctions. Here is an A head happening after a chapter title. Um, does anyone remember from last time what we said? Uh, you know, like what's the what's the modifier for when something is happening after a larger element? Feel free to say, don't remember. Yeah, Mark, that's right. Asp. So uh, we we introduce these asp variations because they mean I don't need space above me. There's a larger element that's going to determine the space between me and this other thing. So we have a CT, a chapter title, followed by an A head asp. A head asp because it's after a chapter title. And then similarly, there's a B head and there's a C head, also with the asp variation. Um, kind of comes in between the source and the uh, composition. Uh, this is where we're gonna take a look at how the author is sort of structuring their material. Um, and they're essentially a head level. So why is something a C head and not a B head? Maybe because we see several smaller head elements under this secondary head. So um, I can take a look at this document here. So we have teacher background knowledge, that's our B head. And then we have a smaller head and there are several smaller heads under that secondary head. So we just sort of identified, oh, it's almost like nesting. Like, okay, here's the large head. Everything else goes within here. Everything else goes another level down. So it's like a third level down head. Okay, um, I kind of mentioned that up here when we're gonna take a look at the whole document, identify elements, uh, and then assign them those, those identifiers and then compose it after we've identified Oh, okay, I see this has like three head levels in it. Oh, I see this has four head levels in it. Um, and that's when that's when that step comes into play. Um, so, so here, you know, we kind of understand that here's our, our fully composed manuscript. It's been edited. It's been sent to uh, through the hub to be refined. Use, you know, the distinction A, B, C, D, E, uh, but they are just the same as, you know, heading one, heading two, heading three, um, and so on. And so, for example, um, in CMS, you'll have, you know, your chapter title, and then you'll have, you know, the main heading um, for a specific section of a chapter. Uh, then underneath that, you would have, you know, your heading level two, right, which for us would be B head. Um, CMS is Chicago manual style. Thank you. All right. And so um, underneath that second level, not content management system. I like that. Um, so, you know, you'd have this, you know, this nesting structure as, um, as Tim has described, and that should apply throughout um, all styles. So APA, um, you know, Chicago manual style um, or anything like that. Well, yeah, essentially, um, if like, so Carla's asking if, you know, if the author does um, a good way of like, you know, structuring their, uh, their document, like half our work is done. Actually, yeah, because once you, once you go through that document, um, there should be hints that say, okay, you know, this is going to be, you know, the main um, head level. And then underneath that, you'll have the second and underneath that, you'll have the third. And then sometimes, you know, some authors get um, heading level crazy and they'll go all the way down to like a fifth level of heads. And we um, can account for that with uh, the head levels in SCML. Um, so, yeah. All right, great. Cool. So, Tim, I'll shoot that back. Um, yeah, thanks. So, here's, um, now, we're, now we're at the stage where, like I said, all, on the left, it's our final manuscript, fully composed. Um, in this example, we've kind of assumed we've worked with the designer. Um, we've given them maybe the composed document, and that composed document has things like CN, CT, A head, F, and that designer is going to say, okay, I'm going to render these things. 
Now the structure still stands. Um, you can design. No, don't have two magnifying glass icons. Um, anyway, so here we can kind of see the um, composition like in action almost. This is what it's going to transform into uh, once we flow it into a template. Now, after the template is defined, the typesetter isn't doing any work to make these look a certain way. The typesetter isn't going through the document and making this green and make it so big or something like that. Uh, there's going to be styles that these hook up to in InDesign, and then they render automatically, essentially. So a lot of their work gets done for them because this is already going to say this head level, has, this is the RC head, has so much space above it. I'll zoom in again. The indents of all our lists are going to be established as part of that style as well. Um, if you're familiar with HTML, it's almost like the comp is our HTML, is our content and our structure. And then uh, InDesign provides the CSS. It provides the, the rendering of everything. So just like in CSS, when you have an H1 and you can say my H1 is size extra large and it's you know color red or something like that, that's going to happen the same way in InDesign. Um, same thing for every single element in the textbook. Um, I, in this uh, example, kind of provided an annotation so that you can review and see, oh, I can see how, you know, P is for body text. Um, UL for list elements, NL for number list elements. Um, so, so that's essentially how this is going to like hook up to in the production. Mark your question. It depends on how much control you as the PM want to have. You could be the designer yourself if you're comfortable with that and instruct the designer, okay, this is all of our B heads are going to have one line space above and they're going to be green and they're going to use the display typeface as opposed to the body typeface if you're going to render it out. What we do internally is if there is no template, we're doing an original design. Um, for example, me as the designer, I would receive the composed manuscript and then maybe some information from the project manager because they're going to know, well, what's the trim size of this book? Are we printing it in black and white or color? Um, and that's one thing we can share with you guys. We have a creative brief that just asks basic questions that we send to clients. So you can get a look at the basic info that we need, but things like, all of our B heads are going to be black and all of our C heads are going to be green. A lot of times that gets left up to the typesetter and isn't the responsibility of the project manager. Um, now, like I said, you could step in and say like, I'm going to design, I'm going to help this. Yeah, a questionnaire. Um, so there's no specific form, although we have seen that from other clients where, you know, you just get a big form like that. Uh, it's a little exhaustive. Um, we can get into stuff like that, but, I, my assumption was that that was going to be a little over most of the PM's head. So let me know if that's incorrect or uh, I can provide examples to people that want them specifically. So far we're here. We've composed it, edited it, handed it to a typesetter designer, and now the typesetter is doing their work. Their work is very granular. It's checking line endings, it's placing images. Um, a lot of the uh, rendering is gonna be handled automatically. But, you know, they still need to go in and place images for the most part, uh, check for typography, loose lines, tight lines, things like that. So the typesetting process happens. I'm just going to kind of put it that way. You go back and forth with uh, the typesetter. They produce a PDF. It typically goes to an editor for proofreading, uh, back to the author for review. Um, sometimes, I mean, you maybe have, you've involved the author in the design. That's not necessary. It's certainly helpful, especially if they come back and say, oh my God, this is not what I wanted. Um, but I leave that up to you. Sometimes you can say, we are the press. This is the template. All of our books are going to look like this. And that is that is the scenario. Um, but you go back and forth, make corrections, maybe create an index. Um, and then the type that is output as a PDF typically and sent to your printer. Um, from that point, uh, we go back into exporting. So now the workflow kind of comes back in again. We're going to move into out of print and into an electronic format, uh, creating an ebook, 
creating HTML page versions of your different chapters. PDF or InDesign. Um, so yes, that's a huge thing. Um, I'll show you my next example. That'll probably help get an idea of what we're looking at. So Mark's question was, is the SML markup metadata still available in the PDF? Not necessarily in the PDF, but it is in the InDesign document. And that next stage we were looking at is exporting XML from InDesign. So I'll go to the very top here. Now, this is something that we'll discuss much more in depth later. And it looks very, uh, it, I think like it looks very intimidating. I don't know if you guys agree. If you don't have uh, background or access to things like HTML or maybe you don't understand tagging in that way, I think this can be very, uh, very intimidating. I'm gonna make it a little bit larger as well. But uh, this is output from InDesign uh, that, that has been reformatted using the hub and our, our tools. So there's built-in tools in the workflow in InDesign that will export the text in such a way that it interacts with the hub and comes out in this in, in a SAM file. You guys can see up there that it says SAM, like an opening and closing SAM tag. Um, we talked about this a little bit. It stands for uh, Scribe Abbreviated Markup. Um, but it's still the exact text that was in the InDesign file, that was in the Word document. We can see again, lesson two with uh, the CN tags. We can see the chapter title, a head aft, B head, C head text, things like that. So this is where we're gonna move into next. Uh, this is where we're converting the document or reformatting it for our print environment to a text or to, a, to an electronic environment. Um, uh, this file can interact with the hub and turn into an EPUB. Um, it can turn into a Word document or maybe like future edition, future editing. Sometimes authors want the final document as a Word file. And it's already gone through so many, you know, edits and proofreads and things like that. So there's a lot of changes that are not reflected in that original Word document. Uh, rather than apply changes in two different places, we would just use the technologies to export this already completed edited file so that it's ready to go. Um, there's a file format after this I don't have an example of, which we're going to get very in-depth to later in the process, called an SCML document. That's the full document with um, metadata. It can have alt text. It can have um, uh, linking attributes as well. And that's what we consider the archivable file because this is the file that you can then use later on to go to anything. It's kind of like technology independent because all the info about linking and structure is in that document. Um, let's see, I'll turn back to our document here. So right now we're down here. We've uh, created the typeset, output it, use the tool to export text, and then use the hub to convert it into that SAM document that I showed you. Um, and then from there, it's really what you want to do there. You know, as I mentioned, ebook, um, word files for future edits and maybe HTML pages. If you're going to put this textbook up on, on the web or something like that. Um, so that's our, our review of, of the document. I think one of the helpful things to look at is that those styles we make choices about in composition are preserved throughout the whole thing. So I think that's it for my, our, our kind of re-overview 